Exchanges such as Bact and Erisex have gotten a lot of attention and coverage in the United States as they build out their respective crypto venues aimed at Wall Street. But there's also LMAX Digital. In Europe, David Mercer has been building out the UK-based institutional exchange. It recently clocked in $1 billion in volumes in one single trading day. The firm counts dozens of banks and trading firms as its clients. Mercer joined the scoop at the Crypto Evolved event in New York City to talk about LMAX's growth, the three things keeping institutions from diving into the crypto market, and what it's like playing rugby at the North Pole. We'd like to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Cash App. Cash App has been the number one finance app on the App Store for almost two years. It was also the first major peer-to-peer payments app to support Bitcoin, and it's still the fastest and easiest way to turn cash into crypto. Cash App now supports Bitcoin deposits in-app, so be sure to move your Bitcoin from whatever wallet you're using to Cash App. Don't have any to deposit? Cash App is also the most convenient way to instantly buy and sell Bitcoin. No more waiting five days for your ACH transfers to come through. With Cash App, you can buy Bitcoin instantly. When you're ready to take full ownership of your private keys, just use Cash App to scan an external wallet's QR code it's really that simple. Cash App also comes with standard banking features like direct deposits and others your bank would never even consider, like Cash Card, a customizable debit card that lets you instantly save every time you use it at Lyft, Whole Foods, and places like Chick-fil-A. It's also a favorite of the Blocks analyst Steven Zhang. He saves money at Chipotle every time he gets a burrito. That keeps Steven happy, that keeps the Block happy, and that keeps the crypto world informed with the best news and research in the entire market. Download Cash App today from the App Store or Google Play, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to The Scoop, the Blocks podcast for decision makers and thrill seekers. We are live. Actually, no, we're not live, but we're in New York and we're in studio with David Mercer. He's the CEO of LMAX and LMAX Digital, which is a cryptocurrency exchange operated out of the United Kingdom. And I'm joined by my, my colleague, my beautiful colleague, Ryan Todd. And we're about to dive into crypto market structure, regulations, trading, and of course, David's favorite topic, LMAX. David, thanks so much for joining us. Good morning. Good to be here. Yeah, great. So we're at the Crypto Evolve Conference in New York, which is hosted by Viable Markets, their consulting firm. And the the point of the conference is to explore a lot of the topics that, David, when you're out on stage, you're you're a you're a common feature in the New York UK crypto uh, conference circuit. Um, what do you think? From your seat as CEO of LMAX, which runs LMAX Digital, which is doing, I think, 400 million sometimes, million dollars. 640 on Saturday. On Saturday, There's your scoop. $640 million worth of uh, trading volumes. What is the biggest issue from a market structure perspective that's hanging over the cryptocurrency market from your seat? Very simple one word, credit. But I could say, look, let's go ABC. Acceptance. <laughs> of cryptocurrencies, that means, you know, you need to have a better use case uh, of these assets. You're seeing that a little bit coming from Asia, and then you have all these people rebelling against it, um, regulators clamping down on it, for example, in New York State. So you have the acceptance of it. The B would be banks and banking. You need efficient banking. The major banks are not even banking uh, cryptocurrency exchanges or crypto funds yet. Why not? I know why not. It's concerns around AML, but we can get into that at a later date. And then the C would be credit. Very simply, if you want the fidelities of the world, um, the bigger asset managers to come in and the pension funds to come in, you need some access to credit because quite simply, they're not going to send their funds to some Silicon Valley-backed retail platform. That's just not going to happen. You need this intermediation, you need quality of credit. So, so far, the industry hasn't solved that. Various people are looking at it, but that's the biggest barrier to the third wave of this cryptocurrency revolution, which is institutional. Mm-hmm. So when you're talking about credit, explain to our, our listeners what you mean by that. What What is missing exactly? So in, for example, the FX world or 
simply look at the equities world, if you want to buy a stock, you have a trusted counterparty. Those, those trusted counterparties are normally regulated and quite often they're banks. So you're pretty secure in the knowledge that your funds are safe. At the moment, if you, an asset manager, for example, wants to buy $100 million worth of Bitcoin, what are they going to do? Send those dollars to some Hujima flip exchange in the Bahamas? Or would they rather send or it Huobi. to... Or Huobi. Yeah. Well, exactly. Huobi. <laughs> or would they rather send it to a bank, right? A trusted counterparty where they know their $100 million is safe. I mean, the major banks, I'll say major, uh, put that in, the, in inverted commas, the banks at the moment that are involved in crypto have very small balance sheets, right? You're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars rather than billions of dollars. So that's the credit you need. The wheels of capital markets are oiled by credits. Now, if you could you, So you bas you're basically saying we need someone to sit between sure. the exchanges and the person who's allocating from their funds. For institutional money, yes. At the moment, you know, the Amex Exchange Group is seen to be the trusted counterparty, but I wouldn't expect to be that trusted counterparty in the fiat world. So we trade $20 billion a day in fiat. You're not, you don't have Barclays Bank, BNP, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs saying, hey, David, here's $100 million, send me back the equivalent in euros, please. Absolutely not. Um, they, they themselves will use their own um, prime brokers, or if you're a fund or you're an asset manager, you and use a bank as a prime broker. Multiple prime brokers. So you're saying, so prime services, like tr traditional sell-side function, uh, that type of... In my opinion, yes. Okay. So there's another way around it, right? So we can talk to the crypto evangelists out there, and let's go forward 10 years. Let's get to the atomic swap. Let's get to instantaneous settlement. Mm -hmm. But it's not there today. Mm -hmm. Someone has to go first. So this is a bit boring and doom and gloom, but in 1974, something arose called banker stat risk, which basically meant in the fiat world, one bank went pop, and all of a sudden, you lost your funds. So then what happened, the, the FX world is very quick. So a whole 28 years later, <laughs> in 2002, they established CLS, which, if you like, is the lender of last resort. And that was the, the big credit shop at the end of the street. You don't have that. In kind of like today. a DTCC. Correct. So you need something like this. So we could like have a shock like that in crypto. We could do. You need a huge balance sheet for it, right? So I'm, I'm all for that, right? If, we, if there's someone with a huge balance sheet that can offer credit to all the participants, then humble exchanges like LMAX Digital can work and, and everyone's sure that the credit is elsewhere. All we do is match buyers and sellers. But at the moment, it's not there. So you're asking people to send money to exchanges and OTC providers as principal. How, do, how would you relate the risk between LMAX and LMAX Digital with regards to, to the lack of a, a credit function in the market or someone providing, rather, that credit? Like credit of last market. resort. Yes, look, it's... Um, and how is that priced in? I mean, is that why our fees are so high? When fees, it yeah. That's the reality of, of the crypto market today. It's the... If credit performs, it's the most lucrative capital market for liquidity providers for traders and for exchanges because you're talking about fees in tens of basis points. Sometimes on the retail exchanges, they're charging 1%. Now, that's ludicrous. Mm -hmm. Put that in perspective. The institutional market in foreign exchange trades at about 2 to $3 per million. Okay, so that's 0.03 of a basis point. I think we're the most efficient in the crypto world. So we start at six basis points down to two basis points for aggressing. Um, so in, in dollars per million terms, you're talking about $60 per million down to $20 per million. But that's still 10 to 30 times X, the FX um, rate. So that's all because of credit. So if you ease credit, then all of a sudden the fees will compress as well and you'll end up with a much more, much more efficient market. What about slippage? What does slippage look like for you guys? Because fees are one thing, but once you kind of put the two together... The slippage in markets, right? That's, that's kind of my job. You know, we run five exchanges globally. The fifth exchange we launched was LMAX Digital. So what I have to do is go and get the best liquidity out there. We think we do. Um, we have probably the top four liquidity providers in crypto today. All bar one of them are also 
some of the biggest liquidity providers in FX and equities. So we just got to keep increasing the depth. The reality is you're not seeing huge tickets in the crypto market today. So there's Even no with the run-up? Not, not depth, right? You see a lot of people buying a coin. So the average trade size is still a coin. So, okay, that's gone up from $5,000 to $11,000 in the last week, but it's still very small. Um, you know, the average ticket size in foreign exchange is 750000 Now, if you think about the way a central limit order book works, whether it be any of the LMAX exchanges or LMAX Digital or any of the equity exchanges out there, you stream firm limit orders into the exchange. That means they're tradable on. So as a liquidity provider, you need to, you're only putting out there what you know might actually trade. There's no point in, in me, for example, having $200 million aside on the book because the liquidity provider is exposing himself and there are, you have this very fragmented market at the moment where something could happen elsewhere which they haven't seen and all of a sudden they get picked off on a stale price. So I would say at the moment, you know, we have any given time 10 to $20 million liquidity both sides of the book. What does slippage look like? Look, top of the book, one coin, you're going to pay a 3 to $5 spread, which is pretty good, the tightest in the market, I hasten to add. But if you want to buy 100 coins, that's going to cost you 100 to $200 in spread. I'll give you one example, a customer of mine on uh, Saturday, in the run-up, their timing was unfortunate. Uh, they started buying at 10200 They finished buying at 10900 Their VWAP price was 10600 on a $2 million ticket. It just so happened they were buying when the rest of the market was buying. No, that's that's fascinating. But what, what I'm interested in, um, it's not just it's it's also about the the prematurity of how we can mm -hmm. engage with this market. Yeah. When we think about ways that folks can sort of reduce risk or or limit uh, slippage, it, it could be things like different order types, like an iceberg order type, where sure. you can sort of slice things up. Uh, a lot of that stuff doesn't exist just because. One, the, the the matching engines are so premature, and and two, we're just not there from a from a technical perspective so on a lot of the funds that are out there. Is that a layup trade for for me again? So no, I'd no. say on LMAX <laughs> Digital, they're all available, right? So if you think how about many, it, how many order types? You name it. So you mentioned icebergs. We have icebergs, right? Now, in most cases, that's not effective for people. If you want to if you want to VWAP an order, you VWAP an order. You want to TWAP it, you TWAP it. You say the matching engines are premature. I have the same technology in LMAX Digital as I have in my fiat exchanges. So on those fiat exchanges, we process 4 billion orders a day. The cancel and replace times are 80 microseconds. Okay, so you have the same players who are trading on the biggest futures exchanges in the world in fiat in equities trading on LMAX Digital today. Now, most of their order execution is it low latency? Is over What's 80 microseconds to you? Sounds pretty low latency to me, right? But what I want, well, so, so what you talk about, and this is where I'm going to pick you up in a little bit, you talk about the immaturity of technology. That's on retail platforms. You know, you're very US centric here. You talk a lot about the US retail platforms. You shouldn't call them exchanges. They're very, very good sales and marketing engines. They're very good at it. They're very good at onboarding clients who want to buy $500 worth of coin. Or a thousand dollars worth of coin. Let's talk about one of the elephants in the room, Coinbase. Right? They had a project in Chicago that they were building out, and that was going to be a low latency, high frequency trading yeah. matching engine where they'd have higher capabilities, more robust platform to in, to have traders engage with the market in the type of way you're describing. Mm -hmm. LMAX Digital, they scrapped that project after spending millions of dollars. I mean, sure. the idea was this isn't where the market is. Retail might be more valuable. Is there a market right now for crypto? For institutional, and what do you make of their pivot? So, look, I don't really like talking about competitors that much. What I would say is building an institutional exchange is difficult. We have a track record of 10 years of doing it, right? So, I have in all my exchanges, I have 23 of the world's largest banks connected to LMAX Exchange uh, and most of the world's largest non banks, so the prop trading firms you know in Chicago and New York City. Um, so they're connected. For us, they use the same technology to connect to LMAX Digital. Now, their bar is very high, okay? So they need to be able to cancel and replace in microseconds, not milliseconds, not seconds, because what they can't have is stale prices out there. And then they need an acknowledgement for every single one of those orders. Has that order been received? Has that order been cancelled? And is there a trade acknowledgement? So when you do that, for example, it's not as simple as the orders. I then have to have this other 
backup called drop copy. Because if something goes down, the internet goes down, uh, the data center goes pop. Internet that hasn't happened in four years, just so you know. Um, then they have an immediate backup of where they were in the stack. And remember, they're processing, any one of these guys is processing millions of orders a day. So we process, can process from one liquidity provider up to 30,000 orders per second. So when someone who's very good at building a retail platform moves into the institutional space, it's a whole new tech stack. It's a whole new requirement of those people. If you like, it's uh, vertical rather than horizontal. So what I couldn't do is have 20 million individual customers trading at the same time. But what I'm very good is at doing is pumping millions of orders down one pipe, right? To a discrete number of participants. It's just a different organization. So Do you think that it's almost, you know, you got to stick to what you know, right? Maybe Coinbase sticks to having that consumer-facing brokerage uh, entity that's successful at marketing and getting people on the platform. And they could just pull liquidity from Almax, the same way that a E-Trade or a Robinhood engages with Nasdaq so they, and Isaac. They could, um, and many of their competitors do. As I say, look, I'm not about to tell them how to run their business because they've done a very good job and uh, they're a very valuable company. So they could move into the space. You must ask yourself, though. David's always thinking about potential customers. <laughs> but you've got to ask yourself, um, where is the value there? As I say, the value, their value proposition is market access to retail customers. Retail customers pay a wider spread, higher fees than institutional. The institutional customers are already racing to zero. They've raced to zero in equities. They've raced to zero in FX. They're going to do the same in crypto. This is all about a volume game. You said, is the market there today? I believe the institutional market has only just started, but if I traded $6 billion this month, uh, so around 50% of, the, of some of the futures exchanges, I think we rank at least top three, if not top one, spot exchanges. Not against Hujima Flip Tether coins, but I mean fiat to coin. So I think there's a market today, but that market is driven by agile HFT prop shops. Um, the banks aren't there yet, but they will come, and they will come because you guys will insist on it. Is it are you are you guys at a point where I, I was talking to an exchange executive over the weekend about uh, some due diligence they were doing, or rather, due diligence a very large forty billion dollar fund was doing on uh, the exchange, and they opened up account, they were onboarded, uh, and they kind of are just sitting there. They haven't made a trade yet. Yeah. Are there any examples where? And, and, and listeners need to understand that these are six months to a year cycles of, of onboarding these types of clients. Um, do you have a lot of banks or large asset managers, five billion plus, who are doing due diligence with you, onboarding, but not touching it, but just getting ready, putting the feelers out? Yes. So the first thing you do there, if you think about it, if you think about my ecosystem in fiat, it's the same API. It's the same fixed API to get my price feed for digital, right? It's the same software, just different hardware. So for price discovery, they take it. And I give it to them for a while for free. So they then build up their trading engines. They build up their algos. They build up their portfolio strategies. I should imagine they're, they're backtesting a lot. I think when the major banks trade... When, the, when you see the first bank trade cryptocurrency, I'd be amazed if it wasn't on LMAX Digital because they're already connected to me. So yes, most of them are connected or connecting, and I have some very large funds connected. Probably of more interest, though, is the, uh, the interest you're seeing from Asia. I was just going to say, I was just, the, the wheels were mm -hmm. turning. He's reading my mind. Is there any... I mean, you have ton of major corporations, their biggest tech companies, moving into the space, line, launching a, I think they launched an exchange, right? Or, or their own cryptocurrency. But there's different folks moving into the space over there. Is there any, any plans to expand LMAX Digital into Asia? We're there already. I mean, that's probably our biggest region today. Mm -hmm. um, I go back to the ABC, the biggest acceptance of cryptocurrency as, a, as an asset class, as a capital market, is in Asia. Mm -hmm. And if you let's face facts, if you go to Tokyo, and I'll be there for the Rugby World Cup um, in October, Ireland should win it, by the way, um, there you can go and buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin. 
So there's been acceptance. There's no acceptance really in New York City, for example. So we see a lot of interest for Asia. And remember, that region is the most disparate in terms of people, countries, and currencies. So you have the most problem with cross-border payments, right? Someone asked me yesterday, someone you'll know well, David, would you be accelerated? If My I, mother? If I get, no, we'll talk about Nonna later. <laughs> uh, if we give you access to you know, 50 licenses in 50 states, would it, would it uh, rapidly increase your traction? I said, no, I'd rather have 20 countries in Asia because yeah. they're using it now. So the United States is difficult because of the federal state system. Um, it's difficult because of you have six states with licenses and then whatever, a whole number of states without licenses. In Asia, you just go, they all need it. People, you have a lot of people working, for example, in Singapore, sending money home to the Philippines, to Thailand, to Indonesia. They're adopting cryptocurrency. They're accepting it today. And there's a real use case for it today. It's not just gambling on two flies going up a wall. So what do you what do you make of the way the U.S. is approaching regulations, right? If you have it, it, some people... And, and our and focus on... on we on were covering. talking about, we had a panel on this not too long ago where we talked about... Wyoming was, the, was a topic, the right? The great state of Wyoming. Wow. You know, people in the U.S., there are two sides to the coin, no pun intended. One, you can have states specifically drive innovation and really, um, you know, set up parameters around this space that can drive adoption in their respective jurisdictions. But at the same time, the other side of the coin is if you have all these different places doing different things, it's cumbersome, it makes, on, the it's cumbersome on the business. You can't get things done. Um, how do you, is that just a weird American states rights thing or is it, is it, is it squashing innovation? I, I, if you pushed me, I'd elect for the latter. So I think it is stunting innovation. But look, you have that. I mean, let's face it, most, uh, most companies you ever establish, if you're a foreigner, when you come to the United States, you sit up in Delaware. Who would have thought that? But um, they have the most established legal system. So we all use that. Now, New York State elected this bit license, but everyone else just goes and operates in Jersey. Mm -hmm. But I have something to say there, which is the United States has their own method of, of regulation. You have this battle always, SEC, CFTC, and very much they protect consumers. That's a good thing. I'm all in favor of protecting consumers. This current minority state license isn't protecting consumers that much. I think, you know, to this day, you can't buy equities on leverage in the United States unless you're an accredited investor. So in other words, if you're rich, it's okay. And you can understand it. But if you're not, just happen to be, if you're not rich, but you're smart, you're not allowed to trade it on leverage. So I have my own views on that. On the UK, we just regulate it. Mm -hmm. We have suitability tests. We have financial promotion rules that says, look, do you understand what you're getting yourself into? I think very much there should be some global, not just in the United States, consumer protection. Because on the last big run-up, everybody from Nona to your taxi driver was saying, hey, should I get myself some Bitcoin? Do you know what you're buying, right? Have we told them all about the risks? In the United Kingdom, the maximum leverage you can have on crypto was two to one. But you write a lot about these huge flip exchanges in Hong Kong doing 100 to 1. That's ludicrous. I can't even fathom 100x. And Bitfinex is, Bitfinex is announcing, or they, well, they laid it out in their white paper for Leo Token, hashtag Leo Token, that they will also be following in Bitmex's footsteps and offering 100x leverage, which is also marketed as a hedging tool. Yes. Is that something that's, is that a hedging tool or is that? It's gambling. Yeah. It's a casino. Um, and again, look, no, I come from seriousness. Is there is there any use case for an institution or a or a large trading firm to have a hundred x leverage? Ah, two different questions. Sure. For, for a large institution, for a bank, that's absolutely fine. I guarantee they wouldn't use it. So I come from a fiat world where there was a hundred to one leverage in, in FX for a long time. But remember, the biggest gap in a major currency, apart from the S and B in two thousand and fifteen, is three percent over the last. Uh, 25 years. So what does that mean? A 3% gap, if you're going against the edge case, the maximum leverage there in fiat should be 30 to 1. Now, what's the extreme move in um, cryptocurrency? 
you know, you're going to say, I don't, you could say 50%, but let's be reasonable and say it's 20%. Well, then the max leverage should be five to one. So in the institutional space, in the wholesale market, don't overregulate. If they want to use leverage, let them use leverage. In the retail space, come on, we have to protect the individual. Do you A, understand the asset, the asset class, right? Do you understand the asset you're purchasing? B, do you understand the effects of leverage? And probably the, you have to go back to basics and say, the thing that everyone accesses on leverage in their life is a house on their mortgage. Now you think about the amount of disclosure you have to read when you get your first mortgage, mm-hmm. right? Or when you get a lease agreement for your first car. Now that's the level of disclosure you must have for private investors and for consumers. You must protect them from themselves. I don't go along with the United States approach, which is just ban it, right? Like you do do equities on leverage because you should offer that aspiration, if you like, to everyone, but protect them, make sure it's suitable, suitable product for them and make sure they understand it. Another thing, another issue in the market structure that a lot of people point out at a lot of these, what's, what, what is the word you keep using? Huge, huge, huge flip. Huge and flip exchanges, some of which are in Asia, but this is a trend that's caught on even for some of the U.S.-based exchanges. And there's a lot of confusion around the legitimacy or or the, not even legitimacy, but the um, the justification for having exchanges also operate over the counter trading desk and make markets on their own exchanges. Some, some people believe some are doing it on an agency mm-hmm. or rather a... Uh, proprietary basis whilst others are doing it mm-hmm. on an agency basis to provide that liquidity for their clients. Um, do you think it's an appropriate function for an exchange to have? Would LMAX ever? I have to say yes, if you do it properly. Mm-hmm. So I'll take you out of crypto for a minute. I'm regulated as an MTF, multilateral trading facility, which is like a CEF in the US, uh, and a broker. The broker trades on the MTF. So the broker acts as, a, as an agent Mm-hmm. for customers who want to open with the broker. Because not everybody, everyone can be an institution and trade directly on the exchange. So this is well established, right? You have this exchange seats, whether it be an equity exchange or futures exchange, you have that, and then you have brokers accessing it. So if you go to the biggest banks in the world, for example, they all run, they might run a venue, they might run STP, they might engage in exchanges, but they also offer broker dealerships. So it's okay but it should be disclosed. You, as the again, as the end consumer, should be very clear about who you're trading with and how your order will be executed. Right? It can't be that. It can't be that the agency desk step, steps in whenever it's a good trade for them and maybe bad for the customer. You've seen enough of the scandals and you know all the broadsheets in FX and equity markets over the last ten years, right? It's that disclosure to the customer. So it's entirely possible that large entities that happen to run exchanges can have agency desks. But you're just going to have clarification of where the Chinese walls are and where the, the communication starts and ends. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. Something interesting I want to walk back on uh, was your uh, thoughts on just the race to, to zero fees, at least from an institutional standpoint. Uh, are there parallels to uh, the rise in electronic trading and efficiencies that we've seen from that in your your prior experience? Um, and like, what, what just kind of some thoughts on those developments happening right now in uh, crypto trading? It's going to happen, right? It's too expensive right now. Market access is too expensive for the end user. I mean, everyone likes to go around bashing the banks for the cost of doing the foreign currency when they go abroad, but. If you want to buy $1,000 worth of um, Bitcoin, the chances are someone's going to charge you $10 for that. That's 1%. That's too high. Mm-hmm. Okay? So in, in the FX market, that would be a dollar. Okay? 10 basis points. Still quite high. Mm-hmm. So look, it has, to become more, it has to become more efficient. It will become more efficient. And the question, the challenge I have for all these retail exchanges, sorry, retail platforms, is can they exist when spreads tie in? Compress exactly that. So I can, but I have a very simple exchange model. Because you've already started there. Correct. I and start he's using, with. They're using stuff that they have already built. That's it. Just repurpose. Well, I mean, that's. And then the next question is: Are we going to see a wave of consolidation among some of these platforms? For sure. But let me let me just say one thing. I mean, the ticket. So building an institutional exchange is, or even a cost-effective exchange, 
is difficult and expensive. So the first ticket I ever printed on LMAX Exchange Group cost me $100 million. Okay? The next ticket cost me zero. That's the nature of an exchange. It has to be robust. You have to be able to manage this massive throughput of orders, right? Uh, this massive low latency requirement of liquidity providers and customers. But once you've got it, then the marginal cost is next to nothing. So I know I can exist at six, five, four, three, two, one basis point, one point one of a basis point, point oh one of a basis point, because all exchanges on the planet operate high volume business models. So that's that's the trick, and there will be a, a push and a pull where the highly profitable platforms out there at the moment actually don't want prices to compress, but naturally. It's no different than Amazon or eBay. Yeah. Naturally, there's efficient price discovery, and you'll all look at where is the most efficient place to trade. To your second point, um, Frank, on consolidation, I think it's inevitable. And again, I'm not going to to criticize the guys who caught the first wave, the guys who were opening a million customers a week. Um, they're big enough to not fail. Mm -hmm. They're big enough to acquire smaller players with an edge, in a different segment. And you guess what? Here's one for you. They're big enough to buy established brokerage houses, established exchanges in the traditional markets. So there's nothing to say that the winners in crypto today can't move laterally right. back in the capital markets. And then all of a sudden, it could be really interesting because you can have tokenization and you can have the, if you like, the crypto world embracing and penetrating deep into the capital markets we're used to today. What do you think, I mean, what player do you think would do that? I'm trying to think about who out there, I don't know if people are thinking about capital markets at a lot. Kind of, of almost sounds like an eToro or like a... Yeah, an eToro could do something like that, but they don't, they just launched an exchange. Yeah, to yeah. want to have like that reach. May not be big enough. There's some of the guys that are, that are bigger. I don't uh, see a Binance or a Coinbase or anything, or any of those guys doing something like never that. Never say never. I mean, look. Because think about it. They, they want to... It is true. Never say never. They don't want to improve. They don't want to disrupt and improve capital markets. They want to create a new ecosystem for the crypto utopian you can future. do it, But you can do it from within. Imagine every equity on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ, other exchanges are available, being tradable against Bitcoin or Ether. Imagine that. Imagine that interoperability. And imagine the efficiencies there um, across imagine asset all, classes. all of the stocks being, you know, on ERC-20 tokens. It's like wrapped <laughs> Facebook and wrapped Tesla. Well, I mean, there's a, look, a more likely, you know, I'm, I'm meeting a few bankers later um, and... Are you going to short them? Probably. Um, but they'll naturally look at it and say, hey, you know, we'll go and acquire one of the um, platforms you've talked about. That's what you'd expect. Mm -hmm. And probably it's the most likely. But I think turn on its head. Imagine if you have a smart growth equity, private equity investor buying into one of those shops, so creating some liquidity for the founders, mm -hmm. for the stakeholders. What are they going to do? They might be the ones who are ambitious enough to take it into other capital markets. And if you like... Uh, make cryptocurrencies, crypto assets pervade throughout the whole capital market ecosystem. Then you might see these large buildings in Manhattan and the city of London being empty, mm -hmm. frankly, right? That is possible, but that's why I am certain the biggest banks will come because there's a lot of smart people there and they know there's a threat to their core business, to their ecosystem, and they know their end customers will be trading this asset class in years to come. Do you have any interest in starting up a retail arm, Telmax Digital? No. Why not? I mean, there's all this talk about having a good balance of retail and institutional liquidity in operating a, an exchange. So, so I would say I already, I already access that liquidity. Put simply, you know, you've got to know, you've got to play to your strengths. I'm, we're very good at running low latency, high throughput exchanges. We're f very far from the best at sales and marketing and onboarding, automatically onboarding millions of retail customers. That's just a whole different tech stack. We don't have that capability. What I'd much rather do is build out the ecosystem. If you like, be the institutional matching engine 
for crypto assets. Who do you view as being your biggest competitor on that front? I can't see any. You're going to tell me names, and I'm not going to um, give them the credit by naming them myself, but you know, there's big names I've been talking about launching for a year. They haven't printed a ticket yet, right? I don't see it. I think we're so far ahead that they're going to be wondering how we did it. Because remember, I already have was, distribution. Do you think it was less about, um, and we know we talked about regulation, but we think about some of the exchanges that haven't, well, or, or have just launched or haven't launched yet. Arisex just started their spot market. Um, don't know what the volumes look like on that. Uh, Arisex. I'll tell you mine, Frank. SCTX <laughs> <laughs> uh, also uh, recently launched their spot market. Still waiting on derivatives to play out. Um, Bact hasn't launched. Um, and then the institutional ambitions that a lot of the native crypto firms have sort of uh, fallen by the wayside. So where do they... Here's my key, right? It's very... But uh, the question I was going to ask is, do you think it's regulations here in the US no. that's holding them back? Where, no. Mm. Where's the distribution? Who's, remember, no one just goes, hey, we launched on board. Everyone beta tests, right? I beta tested for three months. Now, what's my advantage when I beta tested? I have an ecosystem of 5,000 customers already connected, including the biggest banks and funds in the world, even accessing real money algo desks. So I start there. And you talk about, I want to service that retail broker community. What they're good at is not what I'm good at. So they're good at sales and marketing and onboarding. So guess what? Go and get your institutional liquidity and match on Elmax Exchange. Um, why don't they even tell their customers that? Hey, we give you bells and whistles. We give you pretty graphs. We give you access. We give you someone to speak to for customer services. David at Elmax Digital isn't going to do that. But you know what? We match on Elmax Digital because it's the best price and the deepest institutional liquidity out there. So I start with distribution. What's stopping these guys is they don't have distribution. It's the hardest thing to build. It's taken me 10 years to build it. So I just layered another exchange on the top, the fifth exchange we launched being LMAX Digital. What about, so we talked a lot about regulation so far, uh, specifically in the US. Uh, any thoughts on FAT, F-A-T-F? FATF. 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 So let's, let's just give a sort of, let me um, put on my FATF expert hat for a second. <laughs> Walk us through this, <laughs> FATF. <laughs> Basically, it's going to require at least, David can probably speak to it better than I can, but... Uh, require exchanges to when they trans when funds are transferred between different venues, they'll also have to transfer the information behind the trade, mm -hmm. which is something that they're not required to do mm -hmm. at the moment. Targeting money laundering, uh, anti money laundering. But is this something that's going to make business more complicated for you, or more cumbersome? I do it today. Okay, it's the fifth money laundering directive that actually comes in in July. Guess what? It was a prerequisite of my regulation in Gibraltar until I've already implemented the fifth mail on directive. Now, this is the biggest single risk to this industry, and everyone who plays in it needs to wake up and smell the coffee. You need to abide by the best in breed AML and KYC policies that exist today, right? They're not doing it, some of them. Now, if you want to open, it's not just about capital markets. If you want to open an account with your lawyer, right, with your accountant, you have to go through the same AML guidelines. And we adhere to, there's five different sets of them, right? FATF is one of the key ones, but you have to abide by all of them. And it's essential for the legitimacy of the world and the legitimacy of cryptocurrency. So, we're just going to have to do it. What makes it so hard? I can tell you where the coin goes next. I can tell you where it came from. Why is that so hard? Why have you got something to hide? Right? Yeah. It's not so much of a problem. It doesn't say you have to know forever. And by the way, remember, the blockchain's immutable. You can, if you can be bothered, you can go and check it yourself. Right? It's just not that hard. And it's the lowest, the lowest level of professionalism that every participant should be asked to adhere to. If your platform provider, your broker is not adhering to that, then you shouldn't open an account with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's face yeah, it. Yeah, I agree. No, I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to remember what the argument against It's all about, it's complaining over costs and, and being cumbersome to, to adhere to. But it's, I find ironic because you have all these talking heads attack banks for... Um, I think the rule against it is that you're going to see a lot of the activity move off to, to wallets which will make things less regulated, less... I, I feel like it'll still apply, though. 
I mean, you have a wallet now. I mean, look, yeah. I just don't get it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's not that expensive. The whole world adheres to those rules today. Right. Um, this is a little bit more onerous, mm -hmm. but not so much. Look, if you want to play in this game, very simply, if you want to deal with other people's money, right? And, and you don't want to fund criminal activity and you don't want to fund terrorism, then guess what? Apply to these minimum standards and you should all expect them. I expect them. I don't understand the pushback. It's not expensive. Right. And guess what? There are many, many ways that the smart guys have worked out to um, flip between separate coins. Okay, they're only saying, where does it go to? Mm -hmm. I say, well, okay, Frank's coins now go into this wallet, which I believe belongs to Ryan. That's it. It doesn't say that Ryan can't then change his Bitcoin via EOS into Monero, and guess what? You mentioned um, one of the companies do it now. The, the trail is lost, right? It's very possible. So that's the fear that the, the regulators, the large institutions have at the moment is AML. I've got to tell you, the... AML adherence and the tracking and the provenance of coins is much better in crypto than it is in fiat. Every dollar bill you have in your pocket has been on a racetrack. It's probably been in a suitcase and it's probably been used for something else, right? That's it. But because you get it from an institution down the street in an ATM, you think it's good. A coin, I know where it's been and I know where it's going to. So I'm simply not having this where people say it's too onerous. Basically means they're not doing it correctly now and they should. Otherwise, you fund criminal criminality in this world, and that's not where we want to be. Let's uh, let's pivot to talk about you, which is something I'm sure you won't very keen on that. Opposed to <laughs> be opposed to, um, obviously, because Elmax Digital isn't a consumer brand. Mm -hmm. You know, people, especially in the U.S., might not be familiar with your story. Mm -hmm. um, most of my listeners, I imagine, are U.S. based. Tell us a little bit about how you. There's tons of stories we can dive into, like rugby at the North Pole and, <laughs> and other things, and growing up in Belfast during the Troubles. Hope I didn't age you. Um, Just a fact, unfortunately. <laughs> what? Um, how did you t talk a little bit about your journey to finding LMAX and how you sort of wound it up where you are? I'll probably give you that. I'll give you the quick version, right? So, uh, you know, man and boy joined Capital Markets uh, age 18. Um, couldn't afford to get to university, so I went to work uh, and worked at Ernst Young, then worked at uh, a, an investment bank, Credit Suisse. Actually, Credit Suisse first Boston at one stage um, for 10 years, then went through the brokerage world and wound up at Elmax Exchange Group. Actually, I was just a hired gun initially, a uh, highly paid interim chief executive on a flawed startup. Um, and as you'd imagine, it was that was that was no stress, and then a year later, I just bought all the stress by doing an MBO. So we bought two thirds of the company then, and we completed the MBO via leverage buyout at the start of 2017. So again, I, that makes us agile. That makes us unique in the marketplace. In that, when you're dealing with anyone at LMAX Exchange, you're probably dealing with an owner, or you're certainly only one step away from the owner and decision maker. So 25% of my staff are shareholders. So that makes us, we all care. We all have skin in the game. Why did I end up in the crypto space? Why am I talking to you? Well, we tried to, if you like, move the fiat world from OTC to exchange, right? So we launched what is still the only the third central limit order book for spot foreign exchange. And we built it up over the last eight years. From the year I joined, we lost uh, 25 million dollars and last year we made the same so uh, hopefully we've had a decent turnaround in seven or eight years and we connected to all the top counterparts in the street we've got customers in 100 countries i've got 11 offices in nine different countries distribution is key and then those institutions in 2017 said david we need an exchange to uh, like yours to transfer a risk between like minor participants in cryptocurrency frankly we hadn't looked at it um but within Three months, we had a beta test up, and then we launched in May last year. So it's the fastest growing exchange we've ever developed. We've done six million trades to date. This month will be our best month at $6 billion. We had a record day on Saturday at $650 million. Long may the bull run continue. But more importantly, you know, we're, we're big believers in blockchain technology, and we're, we believe 
this could be the second great industrial revolution of our time, the internet being the first one. So we're in, not quite at the start, but we're in because we're believers for the long term. All right. Rugby at the North Pole. Yeah, that let's was hear fun. This, let's hear the story. Oh, look, so we give, we give a little bit back most years. So actually this year, we just played the highest game of rugby ever on, on Everest at 6,400 meters. Uh, two years ago, or three years ago it was now, I trekked with uh, a lot of ex-rugby internationals to the North Pole and played the most northern game of rugby ever. There's a picture of me just in my boxer shorts. How crazy is that? At minus 30. Um, doing star jumps at the North Pole. And look, in total, the, the main reason was to raise... We raised half a million dollars for underprivileged kids um, in the United Kingdom and Ireland. How do you stay warm? No such thing as bad weather, just bad clothes. <laughs> no, actually, that, look, you know what you're trained. What do you play in like a massive Canada goose? Yeah, we looked like, I guess if you imagine ice hockey players uh, with everything underneath being your five layers from base layers to uh, down jackets, I guess we looked like that. So, look, the rugby wasn't a great stand, but it was all about the, <laughs> it was all about the trek there, setting the world records. So we're officially in the Guinness Book of World Records. And as I say, we raised half a million dollars. We did the same again this year, so pleased with that. How do you top that location, Space? Would that no, be they the didn't. Next, well, yeah. the next frontier? <laughs> so we did the most northern game. Um, and then, as three, and then, we, the and then game. we did the highest game. You do the low, you're underwater. I look, personally, I want to go to the South Pole. You know, I've been to the North Pole, um, the most northern game. Let's play the most southern game. Uh, South Pole's slightly more dangerous than the North Pole. Um, you can die there through no fault of your own, whereas the North Pole is quite difficult um, because you have crevices and things like that in the South Pole. So personally, I'd love to do that. Whether I'd do that with an LMAX hat on or a later stage in my life, I don't know. But certainly, I'd like to tick off the, the North Pole and the South Pole. You can sort of cheat and go to like those islands off the coast of Argentina, which would probably be, I don't know if they're playing rugby down there. That's one of the starting points, actually, is that you hop, sort of hop off from Chile, I think it is. But uh, yeah, look, that'd be fun. It's all about, you know, it's where we did it for the Wooden Spoon, which is the children's charity of rugby. And it's all about raising their profile, raising money for the kids. And look, I'd like to do more. And there's other people do similar things. It's just a, it's also good PR for the brand. Um, but yeah, we keep doing it. Every two or three years, we'll do something huge like that. And in fact, we're doing another fundraiser, much less um, aggressive. Uh, we're doing the three peaks in Yorkshire on Independence Day because it's the quietest day of the year for us. And there's 25 of us, again, going to try and walk up, up and down these three peaks in 24 hours and again, raise some money for charity. David, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your insights and hopefully we'll have you on in a, in a future season. Ryan, thank you so much. Been a pleasure. Um, thanks for being on time for once. <laughs> Don't forget Europe when you're writing stuff for the block. Frank, I won't. Okay? Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Scoop. We hope you tune in next time. And don't forget to subscribe and favorite wherever you listen to your podcasts. We'd like to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Cash App. Cash App has been the number one finance app on the App Store for almost two years. It was also the first major peer-to-peer -peer payments app to support Bitcoin, and it's still the fastest and easiest way to turn cash into crypto. Cash App now supports Bitcoin deposits in-app, so be sure to move your Bitcoin from whatever wallet you're using to Cash App. Don't have any to deposit? Cash App is also the most convenient way to instantly buy and sell Bitcoin. No more waiting five days for your ACH transfers to come through. With Cash App, you can buy Bitcoin instantly. When you're ready to take full ownership of your private keys, just use Cash App to scan an external wallet's QR code. It's really that simple. Cash App also comes with standard banking features like direct deposits and others your bank would never even consider like Cash Card, a customizable debit card that lets you instantly save every time you use it at Lyft, Whole Foods, and places like Chick-fil-A. Download Cash App today from the App Store or Google Play, and I hope you enjoy the episode.